Atomism in Early India Atomic theory did not just develop in ancient Greece, but also in India. Here, a man of unknown date named Kanada, meaning atom eater, claimed that all matter was made of spherical and eternal atoms. Marvelously, he claimed that atoms combined into pairs called dyads, which are somewhat reminiscent of our modern molecules. The Jains in India also constructed an atomic theory, in which they claimed that karma also was a material substance that could stick to the soul. And depending on our ethical behavior, the soul either accumulates or loses this karmic matter, which makes the soul lighter or heavier. And this in turn can cause the soul to either float to the heavens or sink to the hells after death, where it will experience another incarnation. We'll also discuss which atomic theory came first, the Greek or the Indian one. And this is a tough nut to crack, since the Indians didn't date their works, and they also didn't write histories. So the dates of many texts have uncertainties of many centuries. We'll also discuss the possibility of influence between Greece and India, one way or the other, which might have happened at a Persian court, where we know Indians and Greeks met, although we have no direct evidence that the atomic theory was exchanged here. So we have a lot to get to. Let's start. Hey, good to see you. This is Stefan, author of In Search of the Sublime. On this World History Channel, we'll trace humanity's relentless pursuit of scientific truth, moral excellence and enlightenment. You'll meet anyone from Mesopotamian astronomers and Indian yogis to Greek philosophers and enlightenment scientists. And you'll meet them firsthand using primary sources, giving you valuable insights that transcend the surface level understanding you get on other channels. So go check it out for yourself. Let's start. There are some surprising parallels between early India and Greece. For instance, they both had a worked out system of reincarnation. Pythagoras and Plato, for instance, believed in it. And both of them accepted the four elements, water, fire, earth and air. While, for instance, China came up with different elements. And both Greece and India had an atomic theory. As a result of all this, it is tempting to think that there was some exchange of information between Greece and India. And technically this is possible, since in the 6th century BC, both Eastern Greece and Western India were governed by the same Persian Empire. And we also know from Greek and Persian sources that both Greeks and Indians were employed at the Persian court. Yet neither the Indians nor the Greeks make note of an exchange of knowledge, so it is hard to prove. And if there was influence, then the question becomes, who came first? And this is also very difficult to establish, because unlike the Greeks, the early Indians did not write histories. As a result, the dates of many texts have uncertainties of many centuries. Let's now compare the two. In Greece, the atomic theory started with Leucippus in the 5th century BC, but Kannada, the presumed first atomist of India, is dated from anywhere from the 6th century BC to the 2nd century AD, with that early date based on the flimsy evidence that Kannada, in not the longest of texts, doesn't mention the Buddha from the 5th century BC, so perhaps he wrote his text before the Buddha. While it is also believed that the text was at least finalized in later centuries. Now about the atom. For the atom, the Indians used the word Anu, which in the Upanishads still meant very small, but in time it came to mean atom. And they also used Paramanu, which was a word exclusively used for atoms, with Parama meaning the highest degree. So it means the highest degree of smallness. Quite a good description for an atom. The Vaisheshika school of India was associated with atomism the most. The first text that we have on the topic is likely the Vaisheshika Sutra, written by Kanada, whose name is sometimes written as Kanabaksa, which literally means atom eater. Unfortunately, the actual text of Kanada is quite unreadable, that is, without also reading extensive commentary for every line of the text, 
But these commentaries came centuries later, the first one roughly in the 6th century AD. And those commentaries are necessary to even understand what is written, but they likely also color what Kannada had meant with new ideas that developed over the centuries. So this is another complication. But we do know that Kannada claimed that atoms are eternal and spherical. And we also read that atoms cannot be perceived because they are too small. Then we read that atoms can combine into pairs called dyads, or in triads or trianuka. And these triads, according to later texts, were made of three dyads. So there are six atoms in total. Other combinations, such as three atoms or two dyads, were considered not possible. And according to most commentators, the triad consisted of those three dyads or six atoms, was the smallest compound of atoms, big enough to be perceived by the senses. In line with this, the later commentator, Anambata of the 17th century, states that, quote, the atom is the sixth part of a particle visible in a ray of sunshine. For those six atoms together can form a visible particle. And this author then connects these particles to the dust that we see in sunshine. In many texts we read that Kannada actually wrote this, which would be marvelous. But after a lot of digging I found out that it was not the case. It came instead from a 17th century commentary on Kannada's work. We also read that Kannada recognized four types of atoms related to the four elements. And he said that only atoms of the same kind can stick together. For instance, two earth atoms can stick together, but not an earth and a water atom. And he then gives a number of properties of these atoms. Fire atoms, for instance, are defined by color and touch. Air involves touch alone, because we cannot see it. And water and earth also have weight as a property. Apart from these four types of atoms, Kanada also recognized a substance called akasa, which later came to mean the ether, a sort of heavenly fifth element that is spread out through the universe, and that we also see in Greece, for instance in Aristotle's theories. But here akasa is described as the cause of sound. We read, sound is the quality of akasa. And besides Akasa, he also mentions the substance, direction, or sometimes translated as space, time, the soul, or self, and finally the mind. So there are nine substances in total. We read, earth, water, fire, air, Akasa, time, direction, soul, mind. These are the substances. And then we read that according to Kanada, Akasa, time, direction, and soul are omnipresent and very large and therefore not atomic. And it is important to know, by the way, that in India at the time, the individual soul in each of us was equated with a world soul or Brahman that was seen as the essence of the universe. And that is why the soul can be seen as very large and omnipresent. The mind, in contrast, which connects the soul to the physical body during a reincarnation, is described as atomic by Kanada. Although all of these concepts are not particularly well defined, unfortunately. And by the way, notice here that the theory here is less rigorous than the Greeks, for the Greeks believed that everything was made out of atoms. Even the soul, according to the Greeks, was atomic which is not the case for the Indian soul in Kannada. Only the mind here is atomic. On top of this, Kannada also recognized 24 qualities that atoms can have. We read, color, taste, smell, touch, numbers, dimensions, distinction, conjunction, disjunction, proximity, remoteness, cognition, pleasure, pain, desire, aversion, and effort are the qualities. Again, also in this case, the Greeks were more drastic, claiming that the atoms differed only in shape, they didn't have special qualities added to them, and that these atoms produced the sensory qualities in us, such as colors, odors and sounds, etc., when these atoms bumped in our sense organs. So the Greeks had no need for all these extra qualities, for these qualities were just seen as illusory 
in the sense that these qualities were not inherent in the atoms, but were instead conjured up by the mind. Kanada also doesn't make explicit that sight is caused by atoms being emitted from objects, as the Greeks did. And we also don't read of attempts to explain phenomena, such as evaporation and the difference in density of objects by referring to atoms. In India, the theory stays very abstract. Kanada does give a rather deep argument for the existence of atoms, although it isn't completely a coherent argument. He begins by stating that objects are permanent when they are not caused, which he claims to be the case for atoms. They are not caused by something else, for they are eternal. A later commentator then adds to this line that although we can't sense atoms, the objects that we see around us are the effects of the atoms, just as from a thread one can make a cloth, and then we can infer the thread from the cloth. So by observing the world around us, we can infer the existence of atoms, he says. Kanada then continues, existence of the effects of the atoms in the objects around us is indeed due to the existence of the cause, that is, the atom. And in contrast, he then adds, impermanence of atoms is the negation of the particulars around us, and this is false knowledge. So if you claim that atoms are impermanent, that could never explain the particulars around us, according to Kanada. And the commentary then adds, when it is said indeed that all effect is impermanent, then what is known is that some cause is permanent, which might mean that even if the effects are impermanent, they must be caused by something that is permanent. And again, the reasoning isn't completely coherent, but it is an interesting attempt. Later texts also give the following argument. We read that if a substance can be divided indefinitely, which the atomists believe is not the case, it becomes nonsensical to speak of distinctions between, for instance, large and small. If there is no atom, they believed, everything would become immeasurable, as both the smallest visible substance and a mountain are now both made of infinite component parts. And again, this argument isn't completely coherent. But they are ambitious attempts nonetheless. And finally, the commentator Prasastapada from the 6th century also explains in his commentary that the universe itself is produced out of atoms and how it will be eventually dissolved into atoms at the end of time. Now let's move to the Jains, who were also atomists. They believed in a universe filled with both matter, which is made of atoms, and souls, which are immaterial. Karma was believed to be a material substance that bounds to the soul, forming a special body inside of us. And this karmic matter makes the soul heavier and determines whether the soul will float up or down to various levels of hell, to the earth, or to various levels of heavens above between each incarnation. And the earliest text in which this atomic view is mentioned comes from roughly, very roughly, the first century BC. And since the souls reincarnate in bodies of different size and shape, you can reincarnate into a flea or an elephant, they also believe that the soul has parts that can be added and subtracted to fit the shape of the next body. And Shankara later criticized this position, stating that a soul that has parts can change and therefore can never be eternal. Now we move to the Bhagavati Sutra, which in its present form dates to the 5th century AD, but it can be a bit older. It gives the following beautiful details about atoms. We read, on the indivisibility of atoms. Question, Panta, is it possible for atoms of matter to exist on the sharp edge of the sword or razor? Answer, yes it is. Question, Banta, while staying there, do the atoms get pierced and cut? Answer. Gautama, they do not. The weapon has no effect on the atoms of matter. And a later question reads. Two matter atoms stick to the other. Why do two stick to each other? Answer. Because there is a minute water bodies between the two. And so two matter atoms stick to each other. And if divided, they make two. 
And then there's one matter atom on one side, and there's one matter atom on the other side. Very curious that they believe that water, presumably water atoms, but that is not specified, were somehow needed to glue atoms together. And we also read in this text, one atom is equal to another atom from the point of view of substance. All atoms have the same substance, with only the qualities of these atoms being different. And the atoms are impenetrable, indivisible, incombustible, without half part, without interior part, and having only one point. Very interesting. And curiously, we also read in these early texts that the Jains believed that points of space and also time is atomic. Now let's move to Buddhism. The earliest form of Buddhism, Hinayana Buddhism, was also associated with atomism, with an early text being the Abhidharma Kosa of roughly the 4th century AD, while the later Mahayana Buddhist completely rejected atoms. And this was because the Mahayana Buddhist reject the reality of the external world, and therefore also the reality of atoms, a very interesting distinction. According to these Hinayana Buddhists, atoms can be seen by the eye when seven, or in some texts, eight of them combine into groups. For instance, in the words of Das Gupta, an atom cannot be pierced through, it is indivisible, unanalyzable, invisible, inaudible, untastable, and intangible. Seven such atoms combine together to form one particle, and it is in this combined form only that they become perceptible. And the combination takes place in the form of a cluster, having one atom at the center and the others around it. The Buddhist also claimed that for taste and touch, objects have the same number of atoms and thus the same size as the sense organs. This is a bit cryptic, but I think it is something like this. If I touch my skin, the area of sense organ that is used is equal to the area of the finger. While for vision and hearing, this is not the case as we can see mountains and hear thunder, which, they said, are much larger than the sense organs. Somehow that whole mountain can fit inside our eyes, which is a problem the Greeks also wrestled with. Finally, we end with a number of schools who were strongly against atomism. The Vedic schools particularly denied the existence of atoms. In the Brahma Sutra, for instance, the author claims that in all of the Vedic texts, that is the foundational religious text of Hinduism, there is, quote, no trace of an atomic theory. And since it wasn't in the foundational texts, it wasn't true, they claimed. And thus unfolded the atomic theory of ancient India. In the next lecture, we'll move to the early 19th century, when the chemist John Dalton managed to explain chemical reactions with atoms providing the first true evidence for atoms. But for now, if you want to know more about Indian philosophy or any other topic from world history, then read my book In Search of the Sublime. You can read it completely for free on worldhistorybook.com or you can buy a physical copy on Amazon. Thank you so much for watching. Bye bye.